At the Last Supper, Jesus urges his disciples to drink of his cup, the cup of the covenant. And shortly thereafter, he was fervently and emotionally praying to the Father. We read about this and talked about this last week. So I continue on that setting. As he had offered his disciples a cup to drink, so had his Father, our Heavenly Father, offered him a cup to drink. But this was the cup of indignation. It was a cup that he did not wish to drink. Just to remind you, we read also last week from Matthew 26, verse 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The cup is often a metaphor for divine punishment. Punishment for sin. We read, for example, in Isaiah 51, verse 17, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. And also in Revelation 14, verse 10, there it says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And thirdly, in Revelation 16, verse 19, it says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So different examples of a cup um, as a metaphor for punishment, divine punishment. Now Jesus knew that drinking of this cup would make him the target of God's divine wrath. All the sins ever committed, past, future, uh, would be on him. And it would mean a total separation from the Father. Um, Matthew 3, verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This same Father would now reject him. He would experience this separation from the Father, to be forsaken. And all of that because of your sins and of my sins. And Jesus knew that this was the purpose of his, his mission, of his ministry. Uh, uh, John 3.17 says, For God sent not, not his Son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Um, that was the whole purpose. But now that the hour approached, he became very aware of God's wrath against sin. And for him it was unimaginable horror. So Jesus repeats this uh, prayer a uh, second and a third time. But he changes the words slightly. Between the first time and the second and third time we see that... Um, in the first time he, he pleads uh, that this cup may pass, the second and the third time you see in his words that he has accepted the Father's will, namely that he has to drink this, this cup. Um, let's repeat that also from Matthew 26, verse 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. We see already here, um, leaning towards acceptance, this, this is, yeah, if it cannot be otherwise, okay, so be it. Yeah, verse 44 then, and he left them, the disciples, and went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same words. He realizes that this is the will of the Father, and he has to go through it. There is simply no other way. There is no other way. This, by the way... Is something we should realize, and especially now at Passover. Um, he did it for us, he did it for you and for me, and we can only be saved through him. There is indeed no other way. Now, the cup is not just a vague metaphor. It's a, it's a powerful image that stayed in Jesus' mind in the remaining hours of his earthly life. 
And he brings it up again when the soldiers come to arrest him. In John 18, verse 11, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And even on the cross he was offered to drink. According to the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, he refused. He merely tasted of it. Matthew 27, verse 34 says, They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. He would not drink, but he tasted. And um, same is in Mark 15. Um, but the Gospel of John renders it a bit different. Uh, there it said that he received it. John 19, verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, maybe... And it's most likely so. Um, as scripture does not contradict itself that John also meant the, the tasting, that that is what he, uh, what he received. In any case, um, it was vinegar. It was bitter. But it was not as bitter as the cup, that, uh, the cup of wrath that he was drinking. And Jesus was thirsting, it says. He was thirsting physically, yes, but he was thirsting spiritually to be reunited with the Father. This was his great thirst. And he is still thirsting today to drink the cup with his bride in heavenly, at the heavenly supper as we read in Revelation 19. When we drink of the wine at Passover, we think of the bitter cup that he drank for our sakes. But we think also of the cup of the covenant through which we are one in and one with Jesus in a covenant bond. And we think of the cup that we will drink with him again in his father's house. It's a great blessing. Remember how greatly blessed we are. Paul writes to the Corinthians uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Cup of blessing, he calls it. And that is what it is. But being in a covenant bond with him means that we belong to him. We bear his name. We identify with him exclusively. We are cupbearers of the king. Psalm 16 verse 5 says, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The Lord is our cup. That means that our lives, our actions, our words, our thoughts, they reflect our Father. We cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of Satan. We either belong to him or we don't. When we drink of the cup of the covenant, the New Testament or the New Covenant, it means that we live his way of life and that we renounce Satan's ways. The covenant bond is very much like a betrothal. A betrothal. Uh, in, in, in biblical times, this was as strong as marriage is today. Once the, uh, the couple was engaged, they, they were um, uh, in, a bo in a covenant bond together. And uh, from that moment on, um, the future bride was bearing the name of, um, of her future husband already. And so that is the, the type that is in there um, when Jesus says, uh, this is the cup of the covenant. And um, we become one with him. In John 17, verse 5, sorry, verse 21, um, it reads, um, Jesus prays actually to the Father, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You see how this, um, this unity is there. Uh, that is what this, this um, covenant uh, bond means. It's very strong. Now Jesus took upon him all the shame, the suffering, this utter separation from the Father, in our stead, and he drank that, that bitter cup, bitter cup.
And indirectly, we share in his suffering and in his death. Not by going through it. He did that and he did it perfectly and he, he completed it. He finished the work. But we do so by drinking the cup of the covenant. Through that, we die with him and we die for him. And we are raised with him. And we can now walk in newness of life, in the likeness of his resurrection. And that makes the bitter cup that he drank into the cup of salvation to us. Psalm 116 verse 13 reads, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. In a way, we follow in his footsteps, like sheep follow the shepherd. We follow the same pattern. As the father offered the cup of indignation to his son, so Jesus offers the cup of salvation, the covenant, to us. And he says, drink ye all of it. And Jesus was free to accept or to reject. It was his, out of his free will that he accepted to do the father's will, to subject. But likewise, we are free to accept or to reject. And he had to go through suffering before glorification. And so do we. Romans 8 verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Suffering goes before the glorification, before the glory. So we are really, in a sense, treading the same narrow path that he went before us. And glory waits at the end. John 17 verse 5 says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus is here praying shortly before he has to suffer, and he is looking beyond it to be reunited with the Father, and to be glorified again with the same glory he had before, even before the world was. So these are things that we must think of before drinking the cup and before eating the bread. In other words, before having the Passover. Do we submit and count the costs as Jesus did? It's not a small thing. This covenant bond is not a little thing that you can easily break or uh, opt out of. We have to count the cost and we have to be careful. And Paul warns the Corinthians um, in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 25 through 31. He says there, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Yes, we drink in remembrance of what he did, but also in anticipation of that future, quote-unquote, Passover, the wedding supper. Jesus longs for it, and so should we. When Jesus offers um, the bread and wine to his disciples at the Last Supper, he says in Matthew 26, verse 29, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the wine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He Again, he looks beyond the suffering, beyond death. He looks at the glorious time in his Father's kingdom, united with the bride drinking of the fruit of the vine. Then he will say once again, drink ye all of it. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, it says in Revelation 19. 
That is what Passover is about. Salvation is not the end. It's the beginning. The end is to be um, for, forevermore in his presence. And he is preparing. He is preparing our place in his father's house. We read it in John 14, the first three verses. He sets our table. Imagine that. Picture it. He sets our table. And soon he will call us home. He will say, all is ready. Come. Come in your rooms. And Psalm 23, verse 5 and 6, beautifully describe this uh, as follows. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is what we look forward to. That is our blessed and assured hope. He will call us home to that place that he has prepared for us. And we will sup and we will drink once again. And all because he drank that bitter cup. That he, because he uh, submitted to his father's will and um, went on the cross and died and resurrected. And yes, he will come again. It begins here and now by drinking the cup that he offers us and submitting to his will as he submitted to his father's will. Yes, Father, your will be done. Have a blessed Passover. Amen.